Amen. All right. <clears throat> we are in Galatians chapter number five this evening. And um, chapter number five is a very special chapter because it gives some really good instruction that I think resonates with a lot of Christians in regards to walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. This is something that every Christian struggles with. You know, we got to walk in the spirit and make sure that the flesh doesn't have dominion over us. And it really gives us some good instruction in regards to this. Now, keep in mind that the book of Galatians is geared towards churches in a region where infiltrators have gotten into these churches and taught these, this false doctrine that people needed to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. And primarily what they were referring to is circumcision. This is a subject and a topic that is uh, constantly being hit on here in chapter number five. And obviously we understand that we don't need to be circumcised physically in order to be saved, but we do need the circumcision of the heart and of the spirit, not of the letter, as Romans chapter two tells us. Now let's, let's look down here in chapter five. By the way, chapter five is also a chapter that people who want to teach that you can lose your salvation will, 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 uh, will use often. They'll use uh, verses such as verse number four where it says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. And they'll say, see, someone who, you know, uh, is involved in sin or they do the works of the law, they're fallen from grace. And what they're insinuating is that one, at one point they had grace, but because now they're living a worldly life or a carnal life, they actually fell from that grace. And we're going to explain what that verse means. Obviously, we understand that you can't lose your salvation. But another verse they like to use is verse 21 when talking about the works of the flesh. And it says, it, it goes through the list of the works of the flesh there in verse 21. And it says, of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is like the go-to verse for Pentecostals and people who believe you could lose your salvation. And they'll say, hey, you can't inherit the kingdom of God if you're involved in these things. Okay, If you remain in these sins, if you do these sins, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, let me just start off by saying that verse 21 is the meat of the word. Okay. All this, this entire chapter is the meat of the word, but what we're going to look at in, in verse 21 is the meat of the word. This is not something that can be understood, you know, right off the bat. It's something that requires study, but by the end of the night, you will understand what this verse is actually talking about, okay? Now, look at verse number one. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, I believe there's three categories of people that the Apostle Paul is addressing in this book, the first category are just saved people who are in these churches of Galatia. Because remember, it's not just one church. There are multiple churches. This is the churches in Galatia, in that region. So the first one, I believe, is actual believers who are being deceived. Okay? There are, because it says there in verse number seven, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Okay? The second group that I believe that he's addressing are potentially unsaved people who are attending these churches and are being carried about with every wind of doctrine, but they're not even saved because they believe that they're justified by the law. The third category I believe he's, he's addressing here are just the false prophets that potentially have infiltrated these churches that may, have, may still be in these churches, okay? Because chapter 5 seems to insinuate some verses, some verses in chapter 5 seem to insinuate that he's addressing them specifically. Now, we understand the, the, verse, the uh, first verse, verse number one, he's addressing safe people because he's telling them, hey, you need to stand fast in this liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And he's encouraging them like, hey, you need to understand what liberty is. Remain in that liberty and don't be carried away with every wind of doctrine. Look at verse two. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So he's saying, look, those of you who got circumcised, you know, those of you who suffered that circumcision, then you're still a debtor to the whole law. Because the fact of the matter is, what these people are not telling you is that he that keepeth the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And you need to keep the whole law, not just the aspect of circumcision, not just, you know, whatever commandment you can find in the Old Testament. If you're going to keep one aspect of the law, you got to keep it all. And obviously we understand no one can keep the law in its entirety. No one can keep the entire law perfectly for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. But the Bible's teaching us that, hey, if you think you're justified by keeping one aspect of the law, then you're a debtor to keep the whole law. Okay, Not just one aspect. You can't just cherry pick the law and say, well, this is the part of the law that you got to obey to be saved. 
And look, people have this mentality today where, you know, they'd say, well, you got to repent of your sins to be saved, but it's their specific sins that they're talking about or the specific sins that they even know about. And often these people are ignorant of the fact that there's sins of omission and sins of commission. Sins of commission is when you basically do things that God tells you you shouldn't do. Sins of omission is when you don't do the things that God tells you to do. Okay. Those two categories are endless because there's a lot. The Bible tells us he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. So that's why it's great that we're saved by faith alone. Amen. It doesn't require effort on our part. It doesn't require our works, not by the works of the law. Uh, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, the Bible tells us. Okay. So he says there, I testify to every man that is circumcised and poor people, <laughs> whoever was in these churches who believed this and got circumcised. Okay. What is circumcision? Circumcision is the removal of the foreskin. Okay. That's what that is. And apparently some of these people who were in these churches actually did that. All right. Joke's on them. Verse number four. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now, again, people will use this. And look, this is, this is what happens when you put the Bible in the hands of unsafe people to try to decipher it. They're automatically going to assume that it's referring to works, that it's referring to the fact that you have to maintain your salvation. You have to, you know, do something, keep the law, love the Lord, stay in the path, do His will. The list goes on and on and on, right? And they'll use phrases like this to, as their proof text. Now, what does it mean to fall from grace? Well, another way to put it would be that they departed from the faith. They have forsaken the way of the true salvation and have believed a lie. This is referring to someone who was never really saved in the first place. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because we have an example of this in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Hold your place there in Galatians. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 1. It says here, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And so if a person claims to believe on Christ, they say they're saved, but then they start believing that it's by works later on, the Bible says that that person has believed in vain. Okay. Oh, no, but they said this. They believed in vain. Because the reality is, if you believe that it's by faith alone, but then you begin to add works 10 years later, you were never really saved in the first place. It doesn't mean you lost your salvation. You were just not saved to begin with. Okay. And it tells us there. That's why it says to keep in memory. You know why? Because any saved person knows that they're saved. The Bible says that the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Amen. You see, the spirit that dwells within us tells us that we're sons of God. Okay. And you may not even know all the doctrines of the Bible. You may not know the depths of salvation and justification and glorification and all the terminology that the Bible uses to describe salvation. But you know what? You know you're saved. You know you've trusted Christ as your savior. That's something that you will keep in memory unless you believed in vain, okay? It's not like, oh, you know, they were saved and then 10 years later, are you 100% sure you died today you go to heaven? I, you know, I think so. I don't know. I, I think, I forgot if I got saved or not. I think I did. No, you, if that's you, you just, you were never saved to begin with. You were never saved to begin with. You believed in vain. You were fallen from grace. Why? Because you're trusting in your works. And if it be of grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. What does that mean? You've fallen from grace, okay? You've departed from that faith. Go back to Galatians, if you would. Galatians. Actually, hold your place there. Go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, chapter 1. Look what it says in 1 Timothy, chapter number 1, <clears throat> and verse number 19. It says, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. I believe that Hymenaeus and Alexander are potential uh, reprobates, they're false teachers. And it says that they put away faith. It doesn't mean that they had it and then they gave it away. It means that they've departed from it. They rejected faith. They're reprobate concerning the faith. Okay? Go back to Galatians, if you would. So Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Now, 
He's not saying that you can be justified by the law. In a sense, he's being facetious here. It's like, those of you who are justified by the law, you know, Christ has become no effect unto you. In other words, he's talking to the people who are trusting in the law to be saved, okay? Look at verse number five. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. You know, we're not maintaining our salvation until the coming of the Lord. We wait, right? It says that the, uh, we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And it says there in verse 6, For in Christ, uh, Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Now, that's a great verse right there. Because when someone departs from the faith, okay, let's say, let's say they are saved and they get out of church, they're no longer reading their Bible, or maybe even they're delving into some false doctrine or something like that. You know, it's never a, it's never a what, it's a, it's a who. Someone has influenced that person to believe that false doctrine. Now, if they're truly saved, you know what? They're going to come back to the right type of doctrine because they have the spirit of truth dwelling with them. They don't have the spirit of error. They have the spirit of truth. And the truth will resonate with their spirit. They will know that it's wrong and they'll get back on track. But if they fully embrace false doctrine, if they fully embrace a works-based salvation, you know what? That person never wasn't saved to begin with. But there's people who were running well. Hey, there was churches that ran well. And someone hindered them that they should not obey the truth. There's pastors that believe in faith alone, but they permit all a smorgasbord of different false doctrines in their church. They're okay with the repent of your sins on the left, the Calvinists on the right, the Pentecostals in the back, and the faith alone in the front. You know what? We call that, we call that a church that has been hindered from obeying the truth. Okay? And it's always a who. And in this case, it was the Judaizers. Verse 8, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you, a little leaven leaven at the whole lump. Oh, you guys make such a big deal about doctrine. Yeah, we're supposed to. <laughs> doctrine is the most important aspect of the Christian life. What does doctrine mean? Teaching. Amen. It's what God teaches. You know, we should give heed to the things that God instructs us to do and to believe. Why? Because if not, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. It'll permeate church, a church and church is and will destroy congregations. And you know what? The sheep become spiritually stupid. They receive a dumb spirit where their ears, because dumb means like they're deaf, right? Or that they can't speak. You know, these churches are dull of hearing. They don't care about, you, you go to these churches sometimes and you start bringing up any kind of doctrine and they're just like, are you trying to be spiritual or something? It's like, yeah, I, I am. I thought that's what we're supposed to do. Aren't we supposed to be spiritual? Are we supposed to talk about doctrine? Are we supp Doesn't the Bible say if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God? Doesn't it tell us that we should speak about righteous things and mind righteous things? That's what we're supposed to do in church. Church is not to discuss the basketball game. Right? It's not to discuss the Dodgers. What, what season are we in right now? What kind of sport? Come on. Brother Polites? What season, brother? NFL. Hey, but you know what? He doesn't discuss NFL with me. He discusses it with Mark or something. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> when we're in church, you know, and by the way, I'm not saying that we're just like Bible, 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 Bible. What I'm saying is this, because we talk about food, you know? <laughs> what I'm saying is that predominantly our conversation should be centered around biblical things. Because we want to we wanna create a spiritual culture in our church where the Bible is the most important aspect, where someone doesn't look at you all cockeyed or whatever just because you bring up a specific doctrine. People are not gonna, they're not gonna be like, whoa, chill out, man, you know? That's what you're supposed to do in church. You see, ch church is not a social club. It's to socialize, it's to fellowship. But you know what? The primary thing that we're supposed to be doing here is being all of thy word. You know, putting the word of God as the primary subject and topic of our lives, okay? That's why we talk about false prophets, amen? Yeah. That's why we talk about different Bible versions and how they're wicked and all these doctrines or whatever because we want to stay fresh amen. when it comes to doctrine. We want to keep these things on the forefront of our minds and recognize, hey, this is the most important aspect of our lives. And look, we want to stay on fire for God, amen? amen. We don't want to be hindered. How do you stay on fire for God? You talk about the things of God. You let your heart burn with the Word of God in your heart. You keep that as the most important aspect. Don't be hindered, right? 
A little leaven can leaven the whole lump. You know, churches a lot of times they're filled with fire. They're not filled with fire. They're filled with fire extinguishers. You know, and unfortunately, sometimes the main fire extinguisher is the pastor himself. Or they get some on fire, born again believer, a newborn who wants to do something for God. They just immediately pull up, put out that fire. And he's like, oh, slow down there. You know, you need to calm down. You know, no, you can't do that much soul winning. And, you know, don't try to study the Bible too much and all these things. Because they're as dead as last year's Christmas tree. Okay. And they don't want anybody to challenge that. You know, pastors who get those type of people in their churches should be thankful that God sent someone like that to say, man, I'm weak. Man, I'm lukewarm. I need this guy. This guy's challenging me. It's time to get on fire for God. But instead, they pull out the fire extinguisher and they hinder that person from going forward. Okay. A little leaven leaven at the whole lump. And that's what's taking place here in these churches. Verse 10. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. So now he's talking back, uh, he's talking to those who are believers. He's like, I know that you're going to stand fast in the faith. I know that you won't be otherwise minded. And he goes, those who are troubling you, those who are, who are causing, who are hindering you, you know, they're going to bear their judgment. And let me say this, false prophets have it coming to them. They have a grave judgment that's going to come upon them because of the fact that they're perverting the word of God and they're teaching people to do so also. Verse 11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. He's saying, look, if it's about circumcision, why am I suffering persecution? Because I don't teach circumcision. I teach the cross. You know, if circumcision was a biblical thing that we're supposed to be doing in the New Testament... I should be being persecuted. I should be persecuted for preaching circumcision, but I'm being persecuted because I'm preaching the cross. What he's telling them is this. It's about the crucifixion, not about the circumcision. That's what he's saying there. Okay. So in context of circumcision, he says in verse, tw- in verse 12, I would that they were even cut off, which trouble you. <laughs> I mean, think about that for a second. Okay. Now, this is very interesting that he said that. Now, you have these modern versions of the Bible that will pervert this verse, and they'll say, you know, I would that they would emasculate themselves, you know, basically cut off their privy parts. I wish that they would go all the way. I looked it up this afternoon. The ESV says it. The NIV says it. All these wicked perversions. They, they just turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. They just completely pervert it here. But what Paul the Apostle is saying in context of circumcision, because when you circumcise, you remove that foreskin, you remove that leaven, you remove that sin, right? Is what you're doing, what he's telling them, he's like, man, I wish that they were cut off because they are the leaven. They are the ones bringing in the false doctrine. I would that they were even cut off just how they want you to cut yourself off, basically. Okay? Want you to circumcise yourself. Now, look at verse 13. For brethren... Ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, what is this teaching us? Well, because we have liberty in Christ, we're not under the condemnation. We're not going to suffer the consequences of hell for sin. You know, the Bible says all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful unto me, but all things edify not. And if we sin after salvation, we will not receive the consequence of hell, but we will receive a consequence. And he's saying here, hey, just because you have liberty, you shouldn't use that liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Like, oh, you know, now I can just sin and just go do whatever I want, you know, or go smoke pot every once in a while. I can go do this every once in a while because I'm saved, you know. He's saying, no, use that liberty to serve one another, to help you to have the capacity to love people, to go so on, to be filled with the Spirit, to do beyond what you're capable of doing on your own, okay? He says there in verse 14, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So here he's talking to the same people, saying, Look, oh, you want to keep the law? Okay, then why are you just cherry picking? This is how you keep the law. Love your neighbor as yourself, and you keep the whole law. Amen. Now he's, talking, he's not talking for salvation. He's just talking about obedience to God's word. And he's saying, Look, if you want to fulfill all the law, this is how you could do it. You know, two birds or a thousand birds with one stone. Love thy neighbor as thyself, and therein, that's how you fulfill the entire law. 
But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's so simple, isn't it? And sometimes we overcomplicate the Christian life. Where it's like, man, how do, I, how do I do right? And how do I do this? Or how can I just be consistent in Bible reading and prayer and, and soul winning? How can I? Look, just walk in the Spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's the equation. That is the answer. Is if you walk in the Spirit, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? You basically submit to that new man. You know, within every one of us, we have the old man and we have the new man. The old man wants to do the things that the old man wants to do, but the new man delights after the law of God. That's what the Bible tells us. So when we submit ourselves under that new man, okay, under that spirit, we're walking in the spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know, at a practical level, we can say, hey, when we're consistent in prayer, we're consistent in Bible reading, we're consistent in, in quoting scriptures when we are tempted, okay, we're walking in the spirit. He says there in verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now look, there's churches out there and Christians, they're like, they have a hard time understanding this. Because they believe like when, the, when you get saved, like everything gets saved. Everything is just saved, right? Not just your spirit, your flesh, your eyeball, everything is saved. Because once you get saved, you shouldn't sin anymore. You automatically have the desire. You will not want to sin. You know, you got the right comforts of this world who just, you know, you're not going to desire to do anything because once you're saved, you're fully saved. Well, then this should be blotted out of the Bible then. Because if that were true, why is the commandment there to walk in the spirit? You know, the commandment is, hey, you need to do this. If not, you're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, look what it says in verse 18. But if you be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. What does that mean there? Well, this is where we get into the meat of the word, okay? What it's specifically talking about here is that because we have these two natures, if we are in the flesh, we, are un we place ourselves under the law, so to speak, okay? And therefore, we actually receive a condemnation because of it. Our flesh will suffer the consequences of submitting ourselves to the flesh. However, when we're walking in the spirit, we are no longer under that condemnation, okay? And we're going to go to Romans 8 just to, to show that, but don't go there yet because we're going to go there in just a bit. Now, look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. So he's going to list what are the works of the flesh, okay? And when we talk about the flesh, what are we talking about? This right here, okay? This is what we're talking about here is our bodies, the sensual aspects of our being, okay? The old man. And he goes through the list here. Let's look at it. He says, The works of the flesh are made manifest, which are these? Adultery. Adultery is physical relations with someone who is not your spouse. Fornication. Those are sexual relations prior to marriage, okay? Uncleanness. That's when you don't take a bath, <laughs> okay? When you, when you stank, <laughs> okay? Hey, don't... Take a bath, amen? Take a shower. Not a bath, take a shower. Excuse me. You should. I'm serious about that, you know? Because, like, sometimes, sometimes it's like the smell can be offensive to other people. You're not, you're not being considerate of other people. You're not loving your neighbor as yourself when you stank. Why are you guys laughing? Do I smell or something or what? <laughs> Man, if you don't want it, it's probably because you know someone who stinks. That's probably what it is. Uncleanness. Now, uncleanness is not just in regards to, um, you know, being clean as in taking a bath or hygiene. It could just, uncleanness is also often synonymous with fornication and adultery, okay? It's just things that are unclean. Lasciviousness, that's lewdness, lust. And when we think of lust, we, often, we automatically think of like sexual lust, but when the Bible talks about lust, it's just a desire of the flesh, okay? That's what that's referring to. Idolatry, this is the worshiping of anyone or anything that's not God. Okay, and often when we think of idolatry, we think of like the Virgin Mary, but you know what? Bibles are often seen as idols as well. We're talking about false versions of the Bible. How do you know if, if a Bible is idolized as someone is when you show them that they're wrong and they're like, no, don't, don't mess with my reign of Lair 1916. This is my Bible. Like, but it teaches false doctrine. I don't care. You know, 
That Bible's become an idol to that person. Burn that thing. Throw that thing in the trash. Use it as toilet paper. Look, okay, I, let me just talk about this for a second. Jack Rodriguez from Will of God Baptist Church, he knows, he, he's the one who told me. He literally had a meeting about me and said this. He's, I must intimidate that man or something, or he's like afraid of me or something. He literally got in front of, uh, up in front of his church and said, this guy said he's going to burn the Ryan of Valera in 1960 at his church. No one should go to that church. They're going to burn our beloved Bible. It's like, you have to go on my YouTube channel. I didn't make a specific video talking about that. It was in a sermon. Probably like at 31.57 you know, minutes or whatever. You have to pretty be, be pretty deep in the sermon. And that, I didn't preach an entire sermon. It was like one of my points. It's when I chase a rabbit. Right? And he's like, don't go to that church because they're burning our Bibles and stuff. And Ulysses, where they're like confronted, not confronted, but they were like, hey, man, your, your pastor, he's like, why is he going to do that for? And Ulysses is like, because the 1960 is wrong. Let me show you why, you know? So it's like people get all, they're, they're, they get all weird and nervous. But here's the thing. It's because these Bibles are idolized by them. For me, it's like, look, if my Bible's wrong, show me that it's wrong. I want to be on the right one. You know, but these are not principled people. These are not people of integrity. These are people who are driven by tradition of man. Well, this is what we've always used. I don't care. You can use the Latin Vulgate all you want. It doesn't make it right. You know, the, the Muslims have been using the Quran for, you know, centuries. It's still wrong. The Mormons use the Book of Mormon for hundreds of years. It's still wrong. We're not going to stand here and say, oh, because the New World Translation has been used for decades. It must be right. That New World Translation is toilet paper. Amen. One ply. <laughs> That's all it's good for. So it doesn't matter how long someone uses something. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And look, anybody out there who is a supporter of the 1960, you contact me and tell me why it's a correct Bible. Show me. Why don't you explain 1 Peter 2.2 2 to me? Why don't you explain the fact that Jude 22 says something completely different than what it says in the Greek text and in the King James Version of the Bible? Why does it change those verses completely? Well, it's the one that we've always used. I don't care. Why does it change it? Look, put it this way. Let's say the 1960 just never changed, or, or um, the 1960 didn't teach any false doctrine, but they just changed verses in the Bible. That's still enough reason to just reject it. Because they're changing what God has said. And people need to put their little preconceived traditional ideas away and forget what their fundamental pope is talking about. Look, do you love the truth or not? And if you love the truth, you're going to hate the Reign of Valeria 1960. Because it promotes lies. And look, what's wrong with the 1569? Biblia del Oso is a great Bible. What's wrong with the 1602? You know, they want to make it seem as though the 1960 is like the most traditional one. It's from the 60s. <laughs> the 1960 is from the 60s. I saw a post and they were like, well, how are, you know, people are trying to get us to change. The, it was because of my video or whatever. People are trying to get us to change the Bible. I'm all about the King James and the Reign of Valera 1960. It's like, what? You must not even read the King James then. <laughs> you liar. You must not even read the King James because the 1960 does not agree with the King James version of the Bible. It's from 1960. And if you want to, if you want to put that in the mix that because it's old, well, guess what? 1569 is before 1960. 1602 is before 1960. Even 1865 is before 1960. Look, reject the Gomez if you want. I think that's a great Bible because it's based upon those older versions of the Bible. You know, they want to criticize Gomez or whatever and say he's proud or whatever. But you know what? The proof is in the pudding, folks. The proof is in the pudding. It's a great Bible. It reads just like the King James Version of the Bible. Sorry if your fundamental pope doesn't like it. You know what? Your fundamental pope is not God. <clears throat> just wanted to chase that for just a bit, okay? Because when churches are starting to have... Look, I thought we were done with these meetings. <laughs> Jack Rodriguez had meetings about me when we like first started the church and... 
you know, like just getting on people for coming here, kicking out Ulysses and his wife for, for, for visiting our church. I thought those meetings were done. I guess not, you know. Can you believe he's doing this? Believe it. <laughs> and it's like, I don't even think it's a big deal. Like, this is just another day in the office for us. <laughs> like, that day we're like, hey, you got your Bible to burn? All right, great, man. So how's work? You know, it's just like, <laughs> it's just normal to us. It's just another day in the office for us. It's not a big deal because of the fact that we understand the truth. Amen. You know, the 1960 is not the voice of the shepherd. Amen. Yeah. It's the voice of a hireling. That's what it is. Okay. All right. What work of the flesh were we in here? Idolatry, okay? Witchcraft, hatred, variance. Now, what is variance? Variance means to be disagreeable. And this is just to be disagreeable just for the sake of being disagreeable, okay? Where you just want to disagree with everything you don't want to agree. You know, in the church, there should be unity, amen? That doesn't mean we have to be on par with every single specific doctrine. We could have differences of opinion, you know, but at the end of the day, there's some people who just want to disagree about everything. I want to do the best to live peaceably with all men as much as lies within me, amen? That's how we should be. We shouldn't be, variance is like variety, okay? Emulation. What is emulation? That's the desire to excel others, okay? That's envy. When, when you want to just do better than someone else, and we're not talking about being competitive. We're just talking about someone who wants to do better than someone else for the sake of praise. Because look, it later defines it in verse 26. It says, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. You see, competition is okay. And I'm saying that because I don't want no lady to get discouraged for the pie baking contest. Amen. <laughs> competition is okay, but not for vain glory, you know. That because your pie is like the best one, that you're just the best Christian better than anybody else or something, you know. <laughs> Where you just exaggerate, you're just like, you got the Midas touch when it comes to pies or whatever, you know. Whatever it may be. Look, maybe your group is the group that someone's, that sees a lot of people saved. You're like, man, I just want to do better than every other group. That should not be the desire, okay. You know, we want to make sure we have healthy competition, and but not to the extent that we put down others just so we can, you know, be elevated or whatever it may be. Sorry, we got the banda in the back. <laughs> Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, okay, heresies. Now, look, heresies, and I believe he's mentioning that on purpose because of the fact that people can, can get involved. Christians say people can get involved in heresy. Now, I don't believe that they will fully embrace damnable heresies. Because there is a difference between heresy, which is basically a teaching that's not biblical, and damnable heresy, where it, it twists and perverts salvation. Okay? Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. Revelings is that just the indulgence of like partying, festivities, you know, the college life, where you just, you know, it's all about partying and drinking. That's revelings, okay? And such like of the which I tell you before, and I've told you in times past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the Pentecostal will say, there you go. How can you say once saved, always saved? That's a false doctrine. You know, these people who do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But yet, they're the ones who are going to inherit the kingdom of God, right? Not you. What is this talking about? Well, again, as I mentioned before, this is the meat of the word, okay? <clears throat> now, let, we're going to go through a bunch of scriptures just to prove and to help you to understand what this means. Now, go with me go to Ephesians. It's the next book. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Look at verse number 1. Because this, this phrase, shall not inherit the kingdom of God, is mentioned a couple times in the Bible. Look what it says in verse number 1. It says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and have given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm just going to show you where these are mentioned here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 
Just so no one points out, hey, you didn't use this scripture, you know, let's look at all of them. By the way, every single one that we're going to, I believe them all. Amen? Amen. Look at verse number 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abuses themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Go to chapter 15. Now, what is this telling us here, okay? Well, remember in Galatians 5, the two natures that are being talked about here is the old nature, the new nature. Old man and the new man. Old nature is representative by the flesh. The new man is representative by the spirit. When you get saved, the Bible says, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. So the Bible tells us that what God does at salvation, when you're born again, is he places his Holy Spirit within you. And Ephesians 4 tells us this, that he sealed there unto the day of redemption. But hold on a second. Not only does the Holy Spirit of God live, live within you, your spirit is regenerated. Amen. Okay? So yes, we have the Holy Spirit of God, but our spirit is also there. Okay? That's what's referred to as the new man. It's that regenerated spirit that we have within ourselves. This is what Romans chapter 7 talks about as the one who delights after the law of God. You know, if you're saved, you've had moments where you just, you enjoy the word of God. Whether you read it or you hear preaching, it resonates with you. And you're just like, this is good. I know what this means. Like, I feel like God is speaking to me through his word. He's teaching me things. The Holy Spirit, that's when you're walking in the new man. Because the new man is just eating it up with fork and spoon. They're just loving it. Okay, by the way, loving the King James. Okay, if you, if, if you get that feeling with like an NIV, you're in trouble. Because <laughs> that's not the voice of the shepherd. Okay, so we see that now there, there are two natures, okay? Now remember what we read in Galatians chapter 5. It says, now the works of the Spirit. No, it says the works of the flesh are manifest. Okay, here's where we get in deep. Because when we sin, when we sin, it's not our spirit that's sinning, okay? When we sin, it's the flesh that's sinning. Like, oh, what are you, not taking responsibility for your sins? No, obviously, I live in my flesh, but I'm using biblical terminology, and in fact, I'm using the same terminology that the Apostle Paul uses when he says that when he sins, it's not him that's sinning, but sin that dwelleth in him, okay? So he makes a distinction between the flesh and the spirit, helping us to understand that when sin is committed, it's not committed by the new man. It's committed by the old man, which is the flesh. Okay? Now, why does it say that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God? I'll tell you why. Because our flesh is not going to heaven. This man you see right here is not going to heaven. It's the spirit that dwells in me. And in fact, this flesh, this, this corruption shall put on incorruption. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in verse 50, just to prove that. 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection. And it, it just drives in extensively this thing of corruption, putting on incorruption, mortality, putting on immortality. And he's just constantly explaining this to help us to understand what the resurrection looks like. And in fact, he even likens it unto burying a seed, right? And when that seed comes out, it's like a tree. You know, when you bury a seed, it doesn't come out like this huge, ginormous seed. It's just like, oh, okay, you know, you bury the seed, and now you get a mustard seed. It's just huge. No, something completely different comes out. And it's helping us to understand that when we die, our flesh, that's why it's important that when we die, we're buried. Right? Because you're burying like that seed. And when we are resurrected at the second coming of Christ, something completely different is going to come out of that. It's no longer the flesh that's going to be there, okay? That thing's going to die. It's not going to inherit the kingdom of God. What inherits the kingdom of God? The incorruption is going to inherit the kingdom of God, okay? Look what it says in verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood shall not inherit, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. 
So this flesh and my blood will not be in heaven. Now, what does the Bible tell us in the book of Leviticus regarding the blood? That the life of the flesh is in the blood. What keeps us alive, physically speaking? It's the blood. You know, you drain someone of their blood, they're going to die. That's what's needed to keep us alive. But what does Jesus say regarding the incorruptible body, our resurrected body? He tells us that the flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that quickeneth. My words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So the new man, the incorruptible man who's going to resurrect is kept alive eternally, not through blood, but through the spirit. So when we compare Galatians chapter number five to 1 Corinthians 15, it makes perfect sense. Because the works of the, uh, of the flesh are made manifest. And you know what? Those who do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Because there are sins that are committed in our flesh. Go to, for, go to Romans chapter number 7. Romans chapter number 7. Let's get some more proof of this. Romans chapter number 7. Look at verse 15. Paul the Apostle is talking about the warring between his flesh and his spirit. He says here in verse 15, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He's not being schizophrenic here. Right? You guys ever seen, a, have you ever run into a schizophrenic person? Yeah. Okay, the split personality. In fact, let me just tell you a story from last week, okay? So <clears throat> I'm about to go to church on Sunday, last Sunday, and, you know, I, I go outside and I look at my van. There's, there's like a key, someone keyed my van, right? Now, you know, cosmetically, my van has never been like beautiful or anything like that. <laughs> So I was just like, whatever, you know, this is stupid. I'm like, some stinking reprobate probably like came over here and did that. Little punk, you know, didn't want to do it to my face or whatever. So I told my wife, I was like, someone keyed our car. Can you believe that? And that night, you know, we're in the living room. We're hanging out. And then I, I hear police outside. And then our neighbors are outside. And there's always police in our neighborhood. So it's just like another day in the office, you know. But then this time I, I, I overheard them and they're like, yeah, look, you know, they keyed this. And I'm like, oh, they keyed someone else's car. So I went downstairs and I talked to my neighbor. I was like, did someone key your car? He's like, they keyed everyone's car on the block. I was like, what? And they're like, yeah. So when the police asked me to go show them my vehicle, I was like, yeah, it's right here. But when I got there, the person who keyed my car finished the job and just went all the way around. <laughs> now I found out later that that person had done it like literally 30 minutes prior to the police even coming because it was fresh. And I was like, oh man, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> you know, it's like all the way around. At the end of the night, I think they, had, they were there for a couple of hours. They literally counted like 15 cars that this person did. Now, one of my neighbors has security cameras, right? And, and here's the thing. He's like, uh, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. So before I get into that, so my neighbor, I was like, you know who did it? And they're like, yep. I'm like, who is it? He goes, the lady who's behind you. And I turn around, this lady walks up. I turn around, there's this lady. She's walking up. She's like, she's like, hey, did they key your guys' car too? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, did they key yours? She's like, yeah, they keyed mine too. What? And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, you know who did it? And they're like, yeah, it's some people. They're over here. And, you know, and literally, they showed me the video, and it's her. She's, you can see her driving up, getting out of her car, going to my van, and just like, Ear! And then going across the street, just drawing on people's cars, just. And look, this is the same lady who 30 minutes prior had just finished King finishing up my car, and she's just like, "Yeah, what are we gonna do about this? We gotta put these people away, and we gotta catch these people." I'm like, "Well, don't worry, they got them on camera." <laughs> I was like, "They do?" I'm like, "Yeah, they got the person's car on camera too. You can see them clearly." It's like, "Oh, that's good. Yeah, because we need to get them." <laughs> Well, a neighbor of hers comes over, and, and he's like, you know, she wasn't there at that time. She had walked back, and he's just like, yeah, that lady, she's schizophrenic, you know. And, you know, she's crazy, and she's been doing these things or whatever. And she was putting in work. She just, she just, she didn't only do our block. She did, like, multiple blocks, you know. 
and you can see it on the camera, like she's just like nothing. And then here's the thing that makes me mad. This guy, he walks outside and then she's walking, she's keen, he's just like. <laughs> the same guy was there when the police were there and he didn't say anything to us. It was like, hello, you know? But you know, she might have schizophrenia, she might have split personalities, I don't know. You know, but I thought that story would interest you, okay? But the Apostle Paul is not being schizophrenic here. It's not like, it's not me who did it, you know? Are we going to catch this person? He understands it's him. But what he's doing here is he's making the distinction between the flesh and the spirit. And he's helping us to understand that when we sin, it is our flesh that sins. It's not the new man. And look, we want to be associated with the new man. That's why he says, it is not I that do it. And when he's saying that, he's, he's speaking in the new man is what he's doing. Okay? Look at chapter 8, verse number 1. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So look, the Spirit of God, or the, the new man, will not receive condemnation. We're not going to go to hell. However, the flesh can receive condemnation because we, it sins. You understand? Look at, look at a pretty uh, um, uh, difficult verse sometimes to, to, to decipher here. Look at verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So it's leading us to believe that obviously when we get saved, we are the sons of God. But when we sin, we're not behaving as sons of God because we're walking in the flesh. This is the reason why 2 Corinthians chapter 6 tells us, Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and be a father unto you, and ye shall be sons and daughters unto me. Okay? Why is that? Because when we are separated, when we don't sin, when we do, we do those things that please the Lord, we are behaving like sons of God. You understand? Now, go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. This is the meat of the word. And, and you know what? People can criticize this all they want, but you know, we're proving it from the Bible that the Bible's telling us here that there are two natures that live within us, okay? And look, when, when we sin, we suffer in the flesh because of it. Because that is what suffers, okay? Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is talking about that glorification process when we're resurrected. Look at verse number 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Now let me ask you, is your flesh born of God? No. The Bible tells us that we're still waiting to wit the redemption of our body. We're waiting for our flesh to be born again, okay? That is why, folks, God places the Holy Spirit of God with, within us, and He calls it the earnest of our inheritance because it's a down payment on us. In other words, though He's purchased us, the full body has not been purchased and it has not been redeemed as of yet. He has not taken it. That's going to take place at the resurrection. So the Spirit is that which is born of God, and guess what? It does not commit sin. It's sinless. Our spirits are sinless, Amen. Well, what are you talking about? I sin every day. Yeah, your flesh sins every day. Your spirit does not because it is born of God. It says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, when we talk to people, we, talk, we, we went unto the Lord, we explained to them, hey, you're, you're born again. They, you know, a babe in Christ has a hard time understanding this. They, they see it as, well, you know, I'm a son of God. And they're right. They are sons of God. But later on, they need to understand that there are two natures that dwell within them. And they're going to continue to struggle to sin or to not to sin, you know, throughout their lives because of that old man that lives there. Okay. That's just part of life. That's what, that's what that is. And you say, well, what's, what's the principle that we can learn there? Well, the principle is this, is that we need to make sure that we're constantly trying to work, walk in the flesh. I don't know. <laughs> walk in the spirit. Okay, we need to make sure that we're walking in the spirit, that we're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. 
We need to make sure that we're, that we're praying, hey, Lord, please fill me with your spirit. Amen. Help me to have the right attitude. Help me to pray. You know, produce the fruit of the spirit in my life. You know, look, and by the way, the fruit of the spirit are not things that we do. This is not like, oh, I got to push out this fruit from my body or whatever, you know. <laughs> the fruit of love, I got to work on love. No, not necessarily. That actually comes as you just walk in the spirit. Amen. Okay, so... That's pretty clear. Does everyone understand that? You know, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, your flesh and blood is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That shall put on incorruption, and the man who is born again, that spirit, will inherit the kingdom of God. Go back to Galatians, if you would. And look, Ephesians 5, when it talks about that these shall not inherit the kingdom of God, he says, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of God. No, upon the children of disobedience. Okay, which are the children of the flesh, all right? And then also in 1 Corinthians, it says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified. Okay? Let's talk about people who are saved. Now look at verse 22. So we saw that there. Verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now what does that mean? Well, when we walk in the Spirit, the Spirit has basically free liberty to produce these, this fruit in our lives. All at once, by the way. Okay, because when you're in the spirit, you know, you're the, the spirit that dwells within you is not just working on how to love. It's not working on how to be temperate. He's not working on gentleness. This is something that he supernaturally already is, which is good news. Because I'm like, oh, man, I just got to work on being gentle. No, you just got to work on walking in the spirit. And if you walk in the spirit, the spirit of God will take care of the rest. As long as you're walking in the spirit, you will have love. You know, meekness, faith, goodness, peace. You will have these things because the new man is already, the, the supernatural nature of the new man already has these things included, okay? And it says there, against such there is no law because you're not under the law when you're walking in the spirit, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Now look at verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, Envying one another. So the main uh, teaching and principle that we see here in the book of Galatians ver chapter 5 is this. The emphasis is this. If you walk away with anything, walk away with this. Let's just be spirit-filled. Yes, Let's walk in the spirit. And that does take a conscious effort on our part to do so. Okay? And it's something that we have to work on every day. We don't have to work on producing the fruit of the spirit. We just have to work on actually walking in the spirit. Okay? You know, when you wake up in the morning... It, it doesn't have to be a conscious effort on your part to say, you know, I need to die to self today. I need to walk in the spirit. You know, you say, well, how can I like for sure know that I'm doing that? You know, how do I for sure know that I'm walking in the spirit? Well, if the Bible's telling us that the inward man delights after the law of God, it's good to start your mornings off reading your Bible. Amen. That's kind of like a, a guaranteed way to just start walking in the spirit. Because when you read the Bible, you're not in the flesh. Your flesh is not, oh, man, this is great. The Spirit is enjoying that. This, you're causing your flesh to do those things. So that's why it's good. Look, read the Bible throughout the day. Read it at night if you have to. But you know, a good way to start off the morning is just reading it in the morning. Even if it's a chapter in the morning so you can start off your day right. Amen. Start off your day reading the Word of God, having a, a, an eternal mindset, walking in the Spirit in order for you to be spiritually successful in the Christian life. Okay, But also understand this. You know, you will fail, you will falter, we're sinners, we will make mistakes, the works of the flesh will be made manifest. But you know what? We should not use our liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love, serve one another. You understand? So that's the principle that we can learn there. And that's pretty much it for chapter number five. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your long suffering, your patience towards us. And uh, Lord, the creation groaneth. We're waiting to wit the redemptions of our body and groaneth and travaileth um, because, you know, sometimes just it just we grow weary of being in this world and, and with the temptations of this world and the trials and the afflictions of our flesh. But we're so thankful that we do have the promise that we wait and hope for the resurrection where we will put off this tabernacle and we will put on incorruption. I pray, God, that you'd help us each and every day to be reminded to walk in the Spirit. Tomorrow when we wake up in the morning on Monday, that we would think upon this 
and that you would help us to walk in the spirit, that we may not fulfill the lust of the flesh, but not just that. Just live a life that's pleasing unto you so we can be spiritually successful in all that we do for thee. May you be honored and glorified in all that's accomplished. We love you, we thank you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.